You see, your priorities are like the steering wheel on your car. Let me say it to you like this. Your priorities today are the accurate predictors of tomorrow's reality. Now, is that really true? Is that true? Or, or do, do my priorities today predict what my life is going to be like tomorrow? And welcome to the Venture Online Experience. We are so thrilled that you've joined us. Please worship the Lord. What holds your heart? What stirs your soul? Let 
promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me Jesus yours is the victory Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope jesus christ my living hope oh god you are my living hope Welcome to Venture Church. I'm thrilled and thankful that you've joined us today for a very important message about priorities. I'm calling this sermon Priority Plans. And, and why not plan your priorities? People plan everything else, don't they? They plan their vacations, they plan graduations, they plan birthday parties, everything. So why wouldn't you plan your priorities, especially since priorities are some of the most important things about you. You see, your priorities are like the steering wheel on your car. Let me say it to you like this. Your priorities today are the accurate predictors of tomorrow's reality. Now, is that really true? Is that true? Are, are, do, do my priorities today predict what my life is going to be like tomorrow? Well, let me, let me tell you a story. In 2018, I happened upon a, a story of a guy, and I, I wrote it down in my book of stories. Now, out of respect, I won't mention his name, but he, he played safety for the Seattle Seahawks. Very successfully, I might say. Six-time Pro Bowl, three-time All-Pro in his nine years with the Seahawks. But boy, there were problems, big problems, character issues. In his final year, he, he was in a contract dispute with the team and made him really bitter and really angry. Well, in his final game of the season, knowing that he wasn't going to be renewed, wasn't coming back, in that final game, he broke a leg. And as they wheeled him out of the stadium on the stretcher, he looked over at the coach and the team, and he did the unthinkable. He, he gave them I guess what I would call the inappropriate hand gesture. Now, I, I thought about that story. I've thought about it. And I've wondered, so if, if priorities are predictors of today's priorities are predictors of tomorrow's reality, what do you suppose happened to this guy? So I did the research. I, I, I Googled him. And I found out that though he wasn't renewed with the Seahawks, he, the Baltimore Ravens picked him up for the next year. He got a four-year, $55 million contract. But as you might guess, the big problems that he had with the Seahawks, he brought with him to the Ravens. Trouble, character issues, troubles with the coaches and other players, even a fist fight with another one of the players, his own players, during the preseason. And right before the second year of his contract, the Ravens just up and fired him. What happened? Well, I wanted to know. In the four years since he was fired, this very gifted and extremely talented player has been unwilling to find a team that would give him another chance. You see, it's true. 
Today's priorities, they really are the accurate predictors of your reality tomorrow. So have you given serious thought to your priorities? Have you ever confronted a bad one? Have you ever established a good one? You know, truth is, you're living your priorities. Even if you've never taken the time to identify them, you are living your priorities. Today, I want you to ponder with me. Just for a moment, I want you to ponder three important reasons why every one of us should be incredibly serious about priorities. The first one is this. We all have limited time. Limited time. There's only, well, one life, and that life is quickly gone. The Bible says it's like a vapor. There's one, one life that you've been given. There's no do-over, no repeat. One life. It's why the psalmist said, Lord, teach us to number our days, to give us a heart of wisdom. The second reason you should be serious about your priorities is there are unlimited temptations everywhere. It's like technology and the crazy culture that we're living in has provided a thousand ways to mess up your life. At every turn, the voices are calling to do this, to go there, to believe that, and they're wrong. The temptations are unlimited. But the third reason you should be serious about your priorities is the limitless blessings. The limitless blessing of, of walking with God. The unbelievable potential of knowing Him, walking with Him, and living out His priorities in our life. The psalmist said, Lord, you've made known to me the path of life. There's, there's joy in your presence. With, your, with you, there are eternal pleasures at your right hand. Remember when we were kids? Remember the teacher would say, you better get your priorities straight. Well, you know, it turns out she was right. What if today were the day? What if you let the light bulb turn on? What if you really, truly went after your very best priorities? Well, this morning, uh, today, I want to share with you three profound priority teachings Three teachings about priority that come straight from the lips of Jesus. His heart to yours. Now, the first teaching that I want to share with you from Jesus is one that comes from within the body of teaching we call the Sermon on the Mount. It's found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 and 34. Jesus said these words. He said to us, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So what are the priorities that Jesus is calling us to? Well, it, the language is priority. Seek first, he says. Make this first. What? His kingdom and his righteousness. What's Jesus telling us to do? He's telling us to put God first in your life. Your, your love for him, your faithfulness to him, your devotion to him comes first. He trumps all. Secondly, I would ask the question, well, what happens to those who do that? Well, Jesus says that all things will be given to you if you do this. If you make God your priority, all of these things will be given to you. What things? Well, the, the context, the, the, the paragraph that this verse is enclosed in is the verse where Jesus talks about the birds of the air, how the Father feeds them, the flowers of the field, how the, how the Father clothes them. And if he cares so much for the birds and the flowers, how much more will he care for you? See, what happens to those who put God first? God cares for them. God loves them. God blesses them. But the question I wanted to ask you is this. What do you think it means to actually make his righteousness my priority? Well, the simple answer is always the best answer. To make his righteousness my priority simply means 
that I'm going to do what God says is right. His righteousness simply means I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to make obedience to his word my number one priority. If God says it, I don't care what anyone else says or does. I will obey his word. I will always seek to do what is right, no matter what. Boy, talk about an important priority in your life. Just think how it would change if you became a man, a woman of God who said, no matter the cost, if God says it, I will do it. Now, Jesus, he didn't just talk a priority game. He actually lived it. Let me take you to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 35 through 39. Now, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions, that's Simon Peter and the disciples, they they went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everybody's looking for you. Jesus replied, Then let's go somewhere else. Let's go to the nearby villages so I can preach there also, for that's why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out the demons. It would appear that this was Jesus' priority practice. It would appear that it was just the norm for Jesus to rise early in the morning, first thing, while it was still dark, and pray. What do you suppose... This story reveals about Jesus' priorities. Well, it reveals that that prayer was Jesus' first priority, that his relationship with the Father was first and most important. But why do you suppose the disciples were frustrated? You know, they were they they were like panicky. Everybody was looking for Jesus and he was nowhere to be found. You see, that's the way it is. With, with the best priorities, the godly priorities will frustrate people in your life. They just don't understand the difference between busyness and priority. But why did Jesus pray in this manner? Well, the answer is simple. Jesus came to fulfill all righteousness. And prayer is always the right thing to do. Jesus' priority time with the Father was first in his life. And and I've often thought about this passage, and I thought, well, if Jesus needed to pray, how much more do I need to pray? But I love it that, that Jesus' priority time with the Father gives him this perfect clarity for the day. You know, notice how the disciples tried to take him in one direction, you know, back to the mob, back to the crowd, and Jesus said, no, we're moving on. Let's go somewhere else. See, that's what God as your priority will do for you. Life down here is easier. It makes more sense. There's more clarity when you get your spiritual priorities straight. Do you remember the story of Joe Kennedy? Joe Kennedy was the the Bremerton, Washington football coach. You know, a number of years ago, I think it was 2015, he was fired, fired from the team. Why? Well, he was a, he was a you know, hardcore Marine who became a football coach, but he was also a, a deeply devoted follower of Jesus. It was his practice. When he first started coaching in 2008, Coach Kennedy, as soon as the game was over, he would walk out onto the field. After the players were gone, he would walk out to the 50-yard line, he would take a knee, and he would thank God for his players. Well, you know what happened. Christians and other, both sides of the team began to gather, and after every game, they would have this wonderful prayer time. It, It happened from 2008 until 2015, when the Bremerton School District sent an official letter from the school district telling him, stop praying. No more prayer. Violation of the establishment of religion clause. But he kept praying, and he lost his job. Unbelievable. But you know what happened? I, 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 I did the research, and you know what happened? He took, it, he took it to the fight. He took it all the way to the Supreme Court. And just 
within the last couple of months, they won. They won. Coach Kennedy has been rehired, and starting next fall, he'll be back, taking the knee and praying. Boy, you got to love people with priorities. Let, let, me, let me go on and tell you another story. Let, let me share a parable from the lips of Jesus, a parable on priority. It's found in Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 15. Here's what the Bible says. And then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then Jesus told them this parable. He said, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store up my surplus grain. I'll say to myself, oh, you have plenty of grain for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. And then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be with whoever stores things up for themselves but is not rich toward God. Boy, what a powerful story. It makes me ask the question, like, what did the rich man do wrong in the story? That's the question. Well, he did many things wrong. But, but the glaring problem is he made it all about himself. Did you notice the use of the pronoun in the story? The, the, the pronoun I shows up six times in just three verses. What should I do? Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down the barns. I'll build bigger barns. I'll say to myself, eat, drink, and be merry. Six times the, the pronoun I appears. Well, why didn't he ask somebody else? Why didn't he ask his wife what he should do, or the kids, or his rabbi, or even God? Why didn't he pray about what he should do? The reason is, his ultimate priority was all wrapped up in himself. But the second thing that he did wrong was he ignored eternity. He lived and acted like there was no God. He lived and acted like he was going to live forever. He lived and acted like this life was all for him and for his pleasure. But the message of the parable is clear. It's clear. See, when I was a little boy, you know, th this story always scared me. It scared me. And now that I'm a, a big boy, this story still scares me. Why? Well, the story re reminds us that there's a creator God in the heavens a God who is the author of life and all of our blessings. And he will hold us accountable on the day of judgment. Accountable for our choices and our decisions, our priorities. We would be very wise to consider the seriousness of this story. You see, our priorities are important to God. Jesus died on the cross he gave his all so that we could live. We could live life, not for ourselves, not for our own pleasure, but for the glory of God. See, there's a day coming very soon in which every one of us are going to stand. We're going to stand before God and we're going to give an account of the life that we've been given. Our, our theme these last couple of sermons has been priority. And, and I told you, if you were with me two weeks ago, I, I told you the story. I said this is a sermon that I've been working on since February of 1996, 27 years. See, that was the season that I was turning 40 years old. I was going through a little midlife crisis. But instead of buying a sports car, I sat down and I asked myself the priority questions. Questions like, what am I here for? I mean, what's my life about? What, what do I want my life to look like 40 years from now? And in that season, 27 years ago, I came up with five priorities. Now, there's not, nothing unusual about these priorities. I chose faith, 
my walk with God. I chose family, my field, my work as a pastor. I, I chose finance and fitness. I, I wanted to be a, a fully discipled follower of Jesus in every one of these areas. My faith, my family, my work, my finance, and my fitness. That was my goal. But for the next 10 years, from 40 to 50, these priorities were just words on a piece of paper. If you'd have asked me, what's your priority? I, I could have told you. I, I remembered all the F words, you know. They were there. But they were just words on a piece of paper. And that really doesn't make them priorities. By the time I turned 50, I was... I was drowning in, in many ways. I was, I was buried and consumed by my work. My weight had kind of skyrocketed out of control. My finances were driving me crazy. And I, I knew that I needed, I needed to get serious. And so I went back to it. In my 50th year, I went back to this idea of priorities. And, and, and I began to work on developing a plan. What I started to do was I, I picked one that I thought was most needy in my life. I picked finance. And I started learning. I started buying books and reading books. I started searching the scriptures. Searching the scriptures and I started listening to God and asking God to help me. And out of all of that season of learning, I, I developed a, a simple little plan of action. I wrote seven steps and I made a commitment that I was going to live these seven steps. Nothing revolutionary. I, I challenged myself to an annual budget. I would live on a budget. I would live on less. I would pay off debt. I would be faithful in my giving. I, I would invest some. I would have a little fun, and I would continue to evaluate weekly. And that's what I did. And boy, I went after it with a vengeance. After a few years, God really helped us, and we were within a few years, essentially out of debt. And then I realized, the kind of that light bulb moment, I realized, hey, if that worked with finance, maybe I could apply it to my fitness. And I did the same thing. I started studying and reading and learning. And out of my study, I, I developed a, a strategy, a kind of a healthy strategy that helped me lose 60 pounds. Now, I, I continued on through the years, kind of one by one, working my way through, learning, growing, developing steps and strategies around each one of those priorities. Well, now, uh, believe me, I, I'm not saying for a minute that I'm the expert or I've got it down. We, we have some little jokes that we share with each other. One, once in a while, Gretchen will ask me a question. She'll say, she'll say uh, now, are you planting trees? And we'll laugh, and I'll say, yeah. See, what that means is during that season, one of those seasons when I was developing strategies for my work, I, I got the bright idea that I was going to grow the church by planting trees, literally. Well, we, we had a piece of property with four acres, and we live in Phoenix, Arizona, which is, a, which is really a very Mediterranean climate. All the trees of the Bible grow very well in Phoenix, Arizona. And I was going to create a Bible tree walk. You know, the fig tree and a carob tree and the almond tree. And I was planting trees and I was just working my poor kids and we were just really pouring our heart and soul into planting these trees with the hopes of people coming from everywhere to go on our little Bible tree walk. And then one day Gretchen said to me, I know this sounds like the dumbest idea you've ever heard anybody say. But one day she said to me, she said, wouldn't it just be better if you worked harder on your sermon? <laughs> Boy, leave it up to her. These women, they know exactly what to say, don't they? She was right. So whenever she sees me kind of drifting off on my priorities, drifting off to things that are maybe a waste of time, she'll say to me, Joel, you sure you aren't just planting trees? But anyway, as we bring this message home today, let me just say to you, let me share with you what I would like to call four priority plans. Things that God has taught me and helped me on the journey. The first one is this. I would say to you, number one, identify the best priorities with wisdom. With wisdom. You see, wisdom is God's word. 
There's a wisdom that comes from above. You need in your life to take a season where you ask God to show you with his wisdom the priorities that he has for you. Number two, you then need to build on those priorities with knowledge. Knowledge, well, what do I, what do I know about priorities of finance or, or marriage? Or, well, what do I know about raising kids or, or pastoring a church? I needed help, and I needed to do the hard work of learning and growing. Learning with knowledge. And then number three, out of that knowledge, implement your your priorities with action steps. Put together some simple rules, some simple steps that you will take every single day. Things that you will do, steps that you will take every day in the pursuit of these important priorities in your life. And then finally, number four, work out your priorities with perseverance. It takes time. It takes diligence. It takes years and years to to hammer your way, to grow through these priorities. It takes perseverance. All I can tell you is it's been a wonderful challenge in my life. Wonderful. Growing and building these essential priorities, and it never ends. I mean, I'm constantly reviewing. I'm constantly going back through the five, and I'm studying, and I'm learning, I'm tweaking, I'm changing. These priorities, they constantly need to be revised. Different strategies, approaches. In fact, currently, right now, I'm, I've, I've implemented a brand new Bible reading plan that I call the 10-mile march. Every morning, Every morning I read my 10 chapters. I mean, I'm committed to to wearing this Bible out. It's a brand new strategy I'm doing. I'm doing a new eating plan, a plan that I started back in October. I've spent hours and hours researching and learning. But I'm always thinking. I'm always growing. I'm always looking at ways to improve my action steps around these five priorities. See, the truth is, my my life kind of revolves around these. And you might say, well, what's that like? Well, it's interesting. I would say to you that my life in some ways feels like it's not my own. It's not. In some ways, I feel like I'm not free to do what I want to do. I'm bound by these priorities. The priorities of God, my family, the priorities of, of my work, pastoring a church, the, the business of my health, and, and even money. I, I'm not free to do what I want to do. Now, as dreadful as that might sound at first, all I can say to you is that it has made me a very happy man. I would say a blessed man. The limitless blessing of God. You get on the path of the best priorities and you're on the best life ever. So what about you? The plan is simple. You you just have to identify the priorities. What's important? What needs work today? Where do you need to grow and then build, learn, implement, develop strategies and, and, and systems that you can apply to your life so that you can be pushing forward in your own life with your walk with God, with with your marriage, with your children, with your finance, all of it. Believe me, it's the best work you'll ever do. Let me close with a quote. My, my, uh, one of my pastoring champions, a guy named Chuck Swindoll, he said this one time. He said, life is like a coin. You can spend it any way you wish, but you only get to spend it once. How true that is. How about today? How about about we surrender our life? How about we yield our life to to the one who gave his all for us? We surrender to live out the best priorities that Jesus died for. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we love you. We worship you this day and thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for being so patient. And Lord, as people have listened today, I pray that your precious Holy Spirit would would put the finger on problems and priorities and issues that need to be addressed in our lives. 
Give us the courage and the strength and the wisdom to pursue these things with all of our hearts. We love you. We commit our lives to you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the, well, the Lord bless you. Thank you so much for joining us today. We love you guys and just pray that God is with you and blessing you in every way. See you next time. God bless. 